what would you hear about the last two? What, what stayed with you? Why, why do you think it is interesting to read it while making it It's just a way into opening the, the discussion. He writes there are comments in it that are aiming sideways about this, for the photos of his time. His main, character, his main target is Hegel. Above that, and something that you have a duty to to do with. And did you start drawing some parallel between this something that sits above or outside the the system and the notion of secret that the Kierkegaard speaks of, with the experience of art making? Do you see any contact? Do you hear any resonance there? Yeah, I think kind of as an artist, there is something in the world which isn't revealed. Sorry, there's something which isn't revealed about itself. You, you can know something about that world. Nobody else does. You put something into it which can't be easily revealed. Probably because you can't quite grasp it yourself. It's the kind of ambiguity mm -hmm. Also stepping out of comfort zone as well. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and having faith and actually challenging yourself um, then as well as your kind of viewers as well. Um, and that sense of often not knowing what it is that you're doing, um, but somehow finding a way through that. Would any of these things that you would have taken from last week, would you place, would you name any of these in what um, Kipping of calls a teleological suspension of the ethical? Or is it still a concept that escapes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kind of to do with um, blocking what you know to be a truth, or just not mm -hmm. Or I was thinking as well of. Um, Blocking what you already know, your own knowledge, or choosing to block that, choosing to stop it. Uh, 
um, but then it's kind of a temporary thing. I think that the temporary has to do with it. Blocking is probably is probably restricting it a bit what the aims are, but it's not in contradiction with it either. Um, I would please enter the, the problem from with two key words that he keeps picking the three problems he poses in three chapters. He speaks of the universal, which he defines as the ethical. And then, alternatively, either the contrast to that, without making a direct opposition, with something else, which can be paid, as most directly discusses, or in the third problem that we were in today, the notion of what is absolute. Now, if you think of the universal, it is <coughs> the, the distinction between universal and absolute is delicate, because one thinks of universal as everything, and absolute as also encompassing everything, so they would see the same concept. Actually, what um, Kierkegaard refers to with universal and the ethical, which is the, the rule of the universal, is that the universal is that which is valid for everything. It is somehow that which can be said and communicated and translated through everything. This is why he's so concerned that he opens the book with that example of the king, the son, and the ambassador. What is the king telling the son in the presence of the ambassadors by having chopped the head of the flowers? There's a communication going on, but it escapes the ambassador. It's not the universal communication, it's not language. Um, the, 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 and the concept Kierkegaard is after is, is it possible, and, and what happens when one steps out of this universality, which is a rule that can be calculated, can be communicated, is valid for everyone, everybody understands it. And what it demands of me, can, can it be communicated back, or it remains inevitably a secret? In a, Nutshell, this is the concept he goes about, and he elaborates it in various directions. But it's this distinction between something that is like currency and can be translated into everything, allows descriptions, allows calculations, and something which instead exists in itself. And you feel it, you savor it, is in your flesh, is in your emotions, it might as well be in your mind. But you cannot explain it with the why, with a number of reasons and a number of causes that can make a clear description of why that is taking place. This is why it, it, the, the Kierkegaard is religious and therefore is in interest in the problem of uh, the sacrifice of Isaac is a theological problem, a theological problem. But at the same time, there is this distinction. What he resists is uh, a reduction to calculability, if you like. And this is why it, this irreducible, this thing that we would rather call art rather than the divine, but we can also call art rather than the divine, is what he calls the absolute that which is in itself, and you are with it, but it becomes impossible or paradoxical to communicate it, because if you communicate it, you destroy it. This is why uh, it finds such a good set of examples in the, uh, in the comedy and the tragedy that it looks at in chapter 3. And it goes on to the various Greek examples and then the mermaid, the mermaid, the merman and uh, the female character. Uh, there, there is something that if it is said, brings destruction, and if it is not said, also brings destruction. So it's a situation which leaves one alone with it. And it is entirely different than having a problem that can be solved and one can move on from it. 
So this is why there is this notion of the secret attached to that. It's not a secret that you do not have to reveal. It's a secret that is impossible to reveal. This is, this is, the, this is the, the core of what he wants to say. But what I think is interesting is to hear what, what, you, what you hear in this in relation to being as an artist, working as an artist. Can you set off to work with a specific problem and execute what you want to do? Or you need to reach a point where you, buy, you, you go past that translatability, that intention that can be realized point by point, and you are somewhere that is unique. And if you actually try to describe it, as you were saying, then you, you lose that something that makes your work work. It becomes user communication. And it's, it's very important to, to, to think of this distinction, because it's not a simple romantic thing where one is in touch with everything and it's the, the sublime thing. It is a distinction between language that is universal and permits description of communication and something that is not not understandable but function according to entirely different terms. So for example when he's writing at the beginning of the third problem the ethical as such is the um, sorry the ethical is as such the universal. As the universal, it is in turn the disclosed. It is immediate. While what's individual is conceived. And there is no way to put the two together. And the scene or the creativity, the problem, what makes art interesting, sits in this paradox. When you think of um, art pieces where you find that it actually works, it is something, and art pieces, whether they are yours or something you've seen, where you can actually see all the components, you can see what the artist has done, you get it, but then at the same time you get it it becomes uninteresting. Does anything come to mind of this sort, an example? Not so much a, a, a art piece, but more a design piece, mm -hmm. like, uh, for instance, propaganda or something. Mm -hmm. Cause that's it, very explicitly telling you something. To giving you a message, its agenda is quite clear. And where would you where would you put that? In which of the two? It would be the universal. That would be universal. Universal. Yeah. And then, for example, the piece, the, the intervention of the whatever you want to call it. Uh, what's his name? Hey, way, way with the life jackets mm -hmm. of the refugees jumping from Turkey to Greece. Mm -hmm. He's done something. Him mimicking the position of the boy that was found around a year ago on the beach in Lesbos. Where would you place that? How he responded. Yeah, but the, the, what he presented. He, he, presented. He, he presented these actions or these interventions, these installations. Would you, how do you do that? In your reference to this problem. I would say that's universal. That's universal. I think I think that's intentionally so as well, because he wants to clearly communicate his frustration with the situation. Mm. So that becomes visual communication. I think. Is it like, simple as that? Mm. There isn't way. any work that's mm. always got a materiality yeah, about it. There's always going to be a material, isn't there? Mm -hmm. So there's always going to be something more use universal with anything. Because everything has got material, even if it's light or sound, it's all got material. 
input, what would be the, the secret in that, in that installation? What you get from it, the thing that you can't describe, I suppose. Mm -hmm. That's how, how I understand it. So we have the communication propaganda and what you get from it and you cannot describe. Mm -hmm. Any other reliever or, or any other example that comes to your mind? Can I just, uh, just mm -hmm. start thinking about that? Recognition is a very, very deep concept. Uh, you come up progressively in the seminars, but it has to do with the universal because you recognize something that is already there. You have this possibility of translating something from one example to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. So then you, you know already what is there or what you can do. So there is actually nothing new. In it. And that why it becomes uninteresting. Indeed, the notion of he plays around with the notion of interest in here, but we'll get there in a moment. Uh, do you can think of any other examples? Just kind of thinking, I um, do this thing where I, I paint onto screens directly, mm -hmm. and sort of there's always that thing where you put the pigment onto the screen and it's going to. When you say start. screen, is silk screen or? Um, yeah, like a uh, screen for screen printing, but okay. I'm just painting directly yeah. onto it. But you never know exactly what's going to happen. It's got that unpredictable thing where it will move, it will create shapes, and it will sort of form something. Mm -hmm. And that's, I suppose that's part of what I want, but I don't ever know completely what I'm going to get. And you mm -hmm. sort of leave it up, and you sort of, you know, create that. And to you, these functions as an, this, this openness, this, yeah. the unpredictability function yes. more as is a, is a secret element that mm. develops into that. Okay. Any other? Think, think of your, when you're working there, and you, you're frustrated because what comes up is, is still not getting there. And then at some point, something actually pleases you, it gives you pleasure. It's this working, it responds to you, and you respond to it, and you can go forward. forward. And that is when it steps out of this translatability. Mm. So the, what you were saying, that whether is that something that you can still in your response not explain for you, is, is quite important as a as element. I was thinking of a, a piece I like a lot, I don't know if you are familiar with it, Joseph Boy's 7,000 Oaks. Mm. How can you describe that? It's 7,000 Oaks planted around the world next to 7,000 stores. Nothing else attached to it. And yet, then you start, at least I, then I start thinking, stone doesn't move, the plant grows, the stone is the material of the monument, which is often referred to the past, the plant grows and is alive. Mm. And then, I, then, for me, that there was a leap. This is not a monument to events that have happened, this is a monument to the future. Cool. So then you have, and that's what I put together from something that was not fully described. And it, but when it functions, it stands by itself. What then Kierkegaard adds to this is that this is not an easy path at all. You, know, you get there by fear and something. You've got to challenge yourself. Uh, you've got to push yourself to get out of the comfort zone, so you're saying. You've got push yourself to positions where you take the risk of doing things that you can't explain. I mean, it is the game of the master in fine art to talk a lot about what you're doing. And then it is also the game when you finish to go back to work alone and elaborate that until you can do a small work that functions by itself. And I always defended what I was doing. I hated it to describe writing about it because to me it killed it. My entire PhD was not 
flat is based on the sign, but I didn't want to do what I was doing. Um, so I cut, the, I cut the entire world secret. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't show anything to the school. Um, I just did it because of the philosophy, which I took in itself as a book. Um, so th there is this tension that one enters in order to, to become creative enough in the synthesis of this work. Does it respond to you? I mean, some say yes, some look at me as if I were speaking. <laughs> <laughs> But Kierkegaard, he went into all different roles as well. Mm -hmm. he, he, he made himself invisible in different characters, so that his whole life was like a work of art. And he had yeah, yeah, the yes. Because he wanted to react. Yeah. You have to think, this book is written in 1843. Full-blown industrial revolution, full-blown Russian science, positivism. Everything was supposed to be knowledgeable, not knowledgeable, uh, open to knowledge, possibility of knowing, possibility of determinism, calculating everything, dominating nature. Um, there is this rationality that makes everything transparent and therefore kills it to the, for the creativity or the, the kind of experimentation that requires nuances of attunement, mm -hmm. which cannot be expressed in numbers. Although the, the art system very often pushes us to, to uh, or calculates us in terms of quantity of success, whether that success is valid or not, you, you get there through the means. It's, there is a jump. Uh, I'm not interested in the success, at least in these terms, but what is very interesting is that you can actually, you know, the very, for example, the way the master is structured here, and the way the master is structured in a school like Chelsea and Goldsmith, yeah, this is not pushing you to become an established famous artist. Uh, there isn't even a module, I believe, that is based on professional practice, while the master I did in Chelsea years ago was all based on promote yourself, doing, become your own agent. And so, they were called self-empowering, but actually it was will teach you to become famous. <laughs> but uh, now, while the interest, uh, the, the, the wonderful peculiarity in school in Birmingham is that instead he looks at all the individualities and allows and pushes you to develop more of who you are. It's a completely different thing. And it is keeping uh, up with this in, 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 in distinction between universal and absolute very much speaks to this problem. Now you, the, the faith, well, one can use faith in the, the notion of faith about what one is doing, but the faith is very much something that cannot be rationalized. And that's why it is, not because art is intuitive and impulsive, uh, it is at times, but it can also be much more um, secular, if you like. But at the same time, there is something that you work on, which starts speaking its own language, and it is its specific language. Therefore, it's not a universal one. You, I like to think of a good art piece as a art piece that says something through a language which the artist has made in that specific piece. You make the rule of the game you're playing, and you win at that. All you want that. <laughs> and it takes quite a bit of work to get to that. But it's not work as in, I know what I have to do, I just have to practice it. I know that I have to practice in order to get in tune with something which hasn't got a name. And this is why one keeps working. Otherwise, we do one piece, and that would sort of satisfy at all. Someone was saying about breaking, blocking something, you know, about blocking. In this sense, one blocks the direct knowledge or breaks the direct knowledge and try to get to a different kind of knowledge, which rightly so Kierkegaard uh, calls attunement, and John insists a lot about this notion of attunement, because you get in tune with something, you resonate along the same frequency, that cannot be expressed, named, uh, and then circulated as a, as a normal yeah. object or normal currency.
is there any passage of the letter, if you read it, that's stuck out as particularly relevant or particularly obscure? There are a number of things that I'd like to read with you there. Um, if you have questions, I'd like to start the question first. Can we just say that sure. I've written that I have from it. I think um, this is what I last week said. So. Uh, Dane, that's what I was asking earlier. Mm. If if we were to do... Uh, no. no? The, I know the problem says Kierkegaard. Yeah. Mm. It mentioned Freud last week, I didn't know. Mm. Yeah, you can do Freud. I think it's okay that you were going to do Because I'm actually a week ahead. Yeah, so you know, you're more of a Freud. Okay, then we, after the break, we, we can do a passage, bit of a passage into Freud. Unless you want to stay with Kierkegaard. There's spent of time in the program too, because Freud is going to next week. Um, what, what would you like to do? Stay with Kierkegaard? Go on. Yeah? Sure. Okay. I change hats. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm struggling with your perspective. To the other guys but that's good because there isn't one reading of this thing. There isn't one reading of anything. Otherwise, it would be just a universal manual for yeah. applicable. What, 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 what do you hear of different descriptions? Well, the, the other guy last week, he, he, he came from a very religious perspective and he mm -hmm. talked about God mm -hmm. and the ground and the Garden of Eden and even the knowledge. And, and um, in my notes, he, he, he also talks about Johannes Silencio. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the silencio, if you think of it as a, as a sorry. Sorry. Well, um, well, I'm not going to say much more, but also that the secret belongs to the individual. The thing that mm -hmm. you're talking about is the gift. The secret is mm -hmm. the gift, and it, it belongs to the individual. So I just wondered if what Millie was saying about her work, how not knowing what will happen on mm -hmm. the screen, that, that magical thing that happens, does it belong to her, or does it exist of itself? What, what do you think? It's just what you think, there isn't a, a, a right answer. Yeah, um, I think it belongs to Millie. Belongs is to it Millie. so unique? And Millie thinks that it belongs to her or belongs to the screen? This is a very good question actually. So this gift, that's the, the other element that comes out of this problem. Mm. Okay. What does it come from? Uh, who it belongs to? Does it belong to anyone? Is the word belong the right word? Mm. Well, you can say belong as in if, if it is the property of someone or what it belongs to. Then there is a different way to I think there's a very important point here, right? The results of the work. Are we talking about the kind of process of the results? Well, I believe everything is on the table because actually there are different ways of working. So for some, the emphasis is probably more on the on the end product. Mm. For others, the emphasis is more on the process. But sometimes artists do present the process down to live performances where there is only process. But sometimes one starts from the fact that one likes to spend time with the work and cares little for what comes out of it because the pleasure is being there in the studio messing up other things. And then what comes out speaks back to you when you do more. And sometimes what comes out is also good and you present it and it functions, you sell it to the, it makes you pay for it. <laughs> um, but it is it is important to to think that it is belonging, ownership. Whether it is the object or the process, do you or actually all of us think that this ownership is one way? Is the artist owning whatever comes out, or is more complex? Well, 
it doesn't seem like an artist is exactly in control of what he produces if there's an episode of a secret involved. So how can you talk about ownership if you well, don't know mm. what you're doing? Okay. But then something belongs somewhere or to someone in the end, in some form. Otherwise, this, whatever comes out wouldn't stay, it would just flow away. Because the artist takes the risks. He goes mm -hmm. through the fear and trembling okay. to create that end product. Mm -hmm. So, surely there's got to be some payoff for all that fear and stuff that you break through. <laughs> you can't say it doesn't belong to you. It's you have to okay. go through that. That's, that's, that's very, good. very good. So then this payoff, I'm staying with it, I'm just <laughs> pointing this out because we, we were looking at the notion of universal which permits or, or demands a translatability. Yeah. It's a currency. Now, is this payoff after the fear and trembling, after the day, you know, opening up yourself to this thing that you don't know what is going to be? Yeah. How can you calculate how it pays off? So, you cannot, you have to believe. Very good. But is that the absolute though? Yes. Mm -hmm. What you call the absolute? Absolutely right. Can you elaborate how you go there? Only really equating back to what I think of everything, everything we do is a, a material process and form or this, some stuff, not on the good stuff. But at the end of it, <coughs> you're going to get to that and explain but you might be able to put it in words but then it's still part of the universal but it's something that you can't actually get words to say what you know which I can't find and um, where you actually get to that final absolute point and I can't describe it because there isn't a way of describing it yeah I mean I, I, I put it between parentheses the the absolute and the universal are not necessarily the idea that the image of a painting cannot be described in words. It's not as direct. It often one encounters this as the first layer. But the secret is, this absolute of the secret, it is even more complex than that. It is something that, it is an experience that, as it was being said by a number of you now, now you cannot say you own fully because the, the intentionality of I, the subject, apply onto the object. It becomes, if you are really honest when you open yourself to your work, progressively breaks down. So then what comes back is a very interesting kind of belonging of ownership where the subject and the object are no longer as clear. It's a, it's a one place. This is why I was interested in how you got to the absolute because it is something. It is a the world makes sense according to its own rules. But otherwise, it's painting by numbers. But you have invested in it. Yeah. So you yeah. 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 By fear and trembling. Yeah. And you, you've risked a lot, and you could have failed. And we have failed so many times in order to get one result at all. And it costs money, it costs energy, it costs time, it's frustrating, and then you get somewhere. And it pays back in a completely different way. Often it pays back by raising more problems than you want to So that, it's a very, this this leap, the, the, the leap that this form of faith brings in is precisely the one that takes you out of that which can be said or can be thought in according to existing parameters. Out of that which is already known, so it's recognizable. We we, we might so many, we've so many times walked into a gallery, into a museum, and just looked around and said, how many times we've seen this? Or it happens to you. You, you, you come up with, you're experimenting with, oh, this is some, oh yeah, but this looks like such and such work. Mm -hmm. And then, although it's good, you, it's not worth keeping because somebody has already explored that, it's already, it, it doesn't have attention. And instead you can, by fear and trembling and everything else, get to the point where something is absolutely your finding. 
so it belongs to you or you belong to it, or to both actually. It, the place becomes an ownership. In this sense, it is, it is absolute. It, it functions according to its own rules. And that one can think of this as the material process of making art, but it can also be the way one is an artist, the life one leads as an artist. I mean, I'm sure that in different degrees you have experienced the fact that being an artist is not easy. Uh, it doesn't pay often. You have to have a job on the side in order to be an artist. Family, and other people tell you why you are you that, why don't you become an accountant, which is much <laughs> safer and sure and pays at the end of the month and so forth. And what pension you're going to have and so forth, all these kind of things. So you, you, and yet you are in tune with something, or you are seeking to become in tune with something. But therefore, there is a faith with I want to do this. Why? Because. Because it, it has its own value. It's, they, they, before Kierkegaard, before Kierkegaard writes and Science, sort of, a monotheistic um, religious structure, but before him, the Greek the classic notion of virtue is that one is virtuous not because it pays back in the form. Virtue is a value in itself. You behave in the right way because that's the right way to do it. It doesn't, there isn't a return on that. So it, one sees that the it, value is entirely imminent. And that's the same logic Kierkegaard is after. And that, if you like, is the same logic art has. What is art actually good for in the great scheme of things? We could, it sounds erratic since we are in an art school, but we could very well live without art. But, actually we wouldn't. There is this thing that is valid in itself that gives so much to us at the same time. So the universal is the accountancy of life, to retain this banal example. And then the absolute is this other thing. That is not only the Sunday afternoon extra that is a thing that gives, that makes it worth living. But it's not easy. It is a, making it worth living that can really be very dangerous. Because you do things that nobody likes, and yet you think that this is what you want to make, and you're frustrated to say the least, because you live in abject poverty, uh, because you try to steal time from your partner, from your family, from anybody you know, to make something. And it's, it's not really you're frustrated, you argue at home because that, uh, you want more time, and they want your time. And, I mean, we, we know this kind of thing, it does happen. But, so there is a, a, all these, and then you break it, and then on the top of that, you step onto this unknown territory where there are no values that can support it. This is why Kierkegaard uh, speaks of fear and trembling, and this is why the certainty based on absolutely nothing that Abraham has uh, in going to sacrifice his only son is so important, because when one is really they are trying to make something, you've got no guarantee of the value of what is going to come out of your work. All the time. Really. But you know the value of your sacrifices, don't you? So you have mm -hmm. to sacrifice something, but you know the value for something but you don't know the value. So it's a paradoxical problem mm -hmm. because the price is not commensurate to the result. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Do you have to sacrifice something that you love in order for it to be a sacrifice? Sorry, say again? You have, you have to sacrifice something that you love in order for it to be a sacrifice? Yes. But if. Yes, no, that, that's correct. But then at the same time, what. Sorry, you're going to be saying. Anna? Anna. Anna. What Anna was saying is that you sacrifice something, it is something you love, so it, is, it, it has real value. But you don't know what return you're going to get. I will actually go as far as saying you don't even know if you're going to get a return. It's a bit of a jump 
when you go to darkness. It is a leap of faith. And many often we sacrifice, the first thing we sacrifice is time and money, materials, and energy, spending for the studio, for another studio. And nothing comes out for so weeks, months, or longer. And yet you keep throwing your life, you sacrifice your, your, yourself to it until, because you, you, you want to get to a place where something, when something is there, but you, you can't quantify it. So this is paradoxical exchange that is precisely what Kierkegaard is presenting. He's now for the, the, the all moral uh, rules, the family relationships, uh, the sense of right and wrong <coughs> that his culture and his society uh, prescribes to go against him in this And yet there is something else, completely open, completely unjustifiable and unverifiable, that's the most important part, which demands that he does something else. And he's caught in between, and he cannot see. He can, it, we, whatever solution, whatever explanation he would seek for uh, those around him, he would never walk because he would appear absolutely mad. He would lose on all fronts, so he can only remain silent. This is why Kierkegaard goes into the example of the tragic theatre. The, the, the Greek theatre that the developed the sense of tragedy presented the hero with generally a binary option, two solutions, which were both wrong, because two sets of laws were in contradiction. They both demanded the hero to do something that would void the other. Generally, it would be the law of the city versus the divine law or the law of the family. This is what one encounters the great tragedy. Uh, for example, the, the, um, the, it's very similar to, to I believe Didi actually does about this, um, uh, Agamemnon going to the war in Troy knows that he is told by the gods that if he sacrifices his daughter, he will win the war. Obviously, this is daughter, so this is exactly the same situation that is here. Um, so there is a divine law and the law of the family. Um, another example is where is one of the, the, the Oedipus cycle. Um, one of the daughter of Oedipus is torn between uh, burying the brother who has betrayed the city, and which the city has condemned to be hanged and be left hanging without being, without burial or respecting the law of the city, which she has defended against the brother, but then betraying the value of the family. So you see that this, 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 this dichotomy. And one is caught in between, and it cannot, nobody will ever tell them, do this because it's the right thing, because there is always another right thing that can be done there. And the, the, the tragic hero is caught in between, and there is no solution. And it, it, it always ends with no solution. It, it, it's an annihilation of the end for the hero. Now, without wanting to be necessarily so tragic as artists, the situation <coughs> enters the same par paradox that Anna brought up. We invest, we sacrifice onto an altar of faith, an altar of belief that we want to do this because we want to do it. And at the same time, we cannot explain, we don't want to explain, and it would be actually counterproductive to explain because it would destroy the fine nuances, the, 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 the resonances of attunement, the state of mind and emotion that allows us to work. I mean, people work in different ways, but generally one needs some form of concentration, whichever form of concentration depends on each other, but some form of concentration that is, is peculiar that allows one, one to be productive. And then one needs to warm up and work a lot. You know, we can go to the studio the first time and make some of the punches. If you paint, you generally start by stretching and, and, and priming canvases for days in order to get you know, in the right frame of mind to, to, to do that, to paint. Um, other things require other, other practices, require other methods, but you need to get to that sort of frame or state of mind in order to be productive. And that's precisely where we start breaking away from the universal and getting to some place. 
which can be no place, where we develop the known of sort. Is this resonating with what we do, or I am just going on some abstract path? <laughs> um, because I think one can dissect Kierkegaard in all his philosophical details relating to, to the philosophy of his, his attacking, especially Hegel. Um, but it would be a bit of abstract if one we don't root it first in, in what we're doing. <laughs> I think it's really interesting the context you put it in. It's completely different from last week because you put it in the context of pra practice. What Dane was Dane is a great. No, he has a lot of knowledge of Kipler, much more than I do, and uh, I'm sure that he gave you a exhaustive and very accurate picture of his, of his work. But it is true that if you stay with the divine problem and the, the ethical versus religious only, it might seem a bit old. Uh, only to me, it always seemed to be, why am I reading Kierkegaard with Johnny when I am interested in life interventions? Uh, it makes no sense. And then progressively, you start understanding that if I want to speak of art in the terms in which I understand it, I have to break away of, from the concept of art as the object of a concept in the path to express some meaning. Now, how to break away the notion that art represents an intention, and from the, the, the notion that art represents an intention, and therefore I need another language. And Kierkegaard is one of the ways into another conceptual framework that allows you to, to speak and develop an argument for yourself and your work and what these people call this. Because otherwise, we are still practicing an exercise of mimesis where the role of art is to paint a landscape that looks like the landscape in front of us. And it's fun, but it can also be, uh, it's not all What kind of work, is it, for example? You paint on script and you're yeah, spending. Printmaking. And printmaking. Yeah. But then you print what you, what you do, or the screen yeah. is the final I, result? Um, I, use, like, I was using wallpaper paste, mm -hmm. and then um, just print it like that, and kind of transfer it onto a piece, a piece of paper. So then the screen still passes the image onto a piece yeah. of paper? Yeah. Other examples? Just to have an idea to, to put the paint in the wallpaper. It, it like reactivates it. as live art that performance can be and uh, plus all the problems attached to the documentation of performance that have been eviscerated in the last 20 years at least. Because performance is the only aspect of the last video art is performing in view of the documentation before putting the live part somehow on a secondary stage almost. But nevertheless, do you really think that the work is fleeting and is completely gone? Is that what interests you, or you just... Mm, just, sort of, just really connected to what you said mm -hmm. earlier as well. I mean, I've, I've done a lot of work um, with objects as well, mm -hmm. making and, um, and other things. Just when we, we touched into the idea of belonging and ownership, mm -hmm. finding the right word earlier, and whether we were talking about the process or the end result. Mm -hmm. So we 
it's just kind but of. But then it's that. quite interesting. This opens another dimension to the notion of this secret, uh, this absolute. Does the absolute, does the secret have to be permanent? But you can get in tune with it temporarily for, for stretches of time in some moments. Because, and I don't believe it is only related to, to performance. It might be, even if you do something that traditionally appears more productive and stuff. What, what do you think about this? It is, it has got to be a continuous thing. There's my secret is there. I have the key, I enter the door of the secret, I use it. And Surely it has to exist outside of time because otherwise it wouldn't be out. Otherwise, you wouldn't keep it. You mm -hmm. wouldn't still have, I don't know, Michelangelo's David still around. Mm -hmm. So it has to, it has to live on, it lives on to the. Because people are can be attuned to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is outside of time. But when you say it is outside of time, <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you, you pose it as something that is always there, as accessible whenever you want, or precisely because it's outside of time, you got something with it? Say that again. When you say that the secret exists outside time, mm -hmm. it is, you, you mean that it is always there and it can be accessed at, uh, uh, at will, mm -hmm. or it does something else? It's always there and can be accessed. I wouldn't say at will, okay. because you have to be in a certain space. You can't just will it to happen. Mm -hmm. But it's always there. Any other experiences about this? Have you got the key for the secret, or sometimes that door opens? <laughs> what about, sorry, here we go. I was going to say, what about kind of social art as social practice? Mm -hmm. Because for me, this works, I can see it working for my practice in terms of being, you know, a solitary artist. Mm -hmm. But then if you open it up and you're working with others mm -hmm. on a joint project say, then can that be absolute if you've all got to be aware of the secret and you're all where you've got to all work towards the same goal is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. There has to be a goal communicated, but then do you lose the secret because you're all having to work together? Am I making any sense? Okay. Yeah and I think as well because I've been in the teaching world mm -hmm. for the last few years and obviously something that is happening now is that art education is kind of disappearing from schools really. Mm -hmm. So it's something I'm majorly aware of in terms of advocacy and fighting for that right for art to remain in schools. But then how do you do that if you can't express why it's important? And I can see why Kierkegaard says that. But how, you know, how do we fight, or how does somebody like me fight for our education mm -hmm. and the value of it to people who aren't subject, you know, who, because mm -hmm. we all here are kind of on the same page, we all value art, we're all here for a similar purpose, that if you're talking to people who have no understanding of art, and you're trying to fight in those circles for our education, how do you do that without... Mm -hmm. Because if you were using this kind of analogy, you'd have to say, well, art is important in schools, but we can't explain why. And, <laughs> and then no, you can yes. see them going, but, okay, let's write that off the curriculum. But, but isn't that precisely why it's valuable? Because we can't explain why. Well, we understand that. But you can use... I mean, that's not going to work. You can't ex can explain them, but I think you kind of... Don't you learn to develop different levels of the language? Explanation, yeah. And, then and choose the right one to suit yeah. a particular setting when you're working. 
I think you can use examples from the past. We didn't know that the impressionism is coming, we didn't know that the cubism is coming, and you can always say, listen, without pushing art forward, we wouldn't have Picasso. And everyone knows that. So that's a quite very common, I think, example which you can use to defend. The thing between us and them is that they're interested in the craft. That's why David is still here. David is actually Michelangelo is stay with, they see it as a craft, but we see it as the history and something else as well. And this is probably why they take it off the curriculum because the craft is disappearing and we only have a secret. Yeah. Uh, mm. yeah so that's basically that's, why. Yeah, that's very true. But then how, where do we go from here? Because I'm not accepting an answer. It's, <laughs> it's not a very good question. But the, the question is important. I mean, you, you asked two questions. Yeah. <laughs> One is how about collaborative or participatory practice, mm -hmm. and then two, a more directly or, stri or, or strictly political question on how we defend our education in front of the policy of this Yes. Now, the second to me is much more difficult to answer than the first question. Mm -hmm. um, there was a while ago. A while ago, could be three years ago, an article of a French philosopher called Alain Badieu on the Guardians, who was speaking exactly to this problem. He was saying that the left is on the losing feet because it has lost the universal language. Now, he was not directly criticizing Kierkegaard, but he was criticizing a notion of. Um, or, or, or an accepted heterogeneity of modes of producing sense, logics, communication, uh, and parameters of value, that is what allows the coexistence of entirely different ways of either being artists or being human. You, know, the, you, you need heterogeneity to allow the Church of England to exist and the LGBT movement to exist without clashing and without wanting to censor either, for example. Very superficial mm, paradoxes. Actually, the Church of England is quite open minded, versus the Italian Church, in this case, for example. But um, he was saying, without having, if, if this heterogeneity is, is, is allowed to continue without a universal language that can be, can unify us all versus the rampant and uh, rapacious capitalism, we will always lose. So this would speak to. It's just an example to the second part you asked. I, uh, but you were right in saying there are different degrees of intensity and different depths at which we're speaking. I believe that in the case of uh, Victor, uh, Victor Stan, uh, Kierkegaard, he's very much addressing, he actually keeps opposing the universal as an individual. He's an individual personal experience that is at play here. This is why it's not communicable. Um, but it does also speak to a whole line of philosophical discourses and questions that uh, are not the only one. There, are, there, are, there is a line that comes out of a more um, universal based way of thinking. That is Hegel, Marx, Marx in the School of Frankfurt and all this, the social thinking that came from that, which instead re retains the universal has a very important value. It does problematize it, but it speaks exactly to this question of Rosen. It's very important. Um, I believe that the first question instead, it's um, it's interesting because there might be instances where a group of people might be in tune. And has anybody ever worked with improvisation? For example. Musician. Musician. Then you know that there is the musician in jazz is called being in the zone is a bit of a funny expression but there is a moment where you can be in tune with somebody else and we, it is easier to describe it musically but there are moments where you can be in tune with a soulmate with whom you constantly dialogue about your work and you can collaborate and those moments are not uh, permanent this, this speaks to the, to the question of live arts as well they emerge, they last for a while, and as in speaking as they emerge, they fade off. Um, in other books, um, um, okay, 
Kierkegaard writes precisely about the impossibility to repeat on will these states. And that's also that, again, he speaks of the states of soul versus religion, but it very much speaks of the, the experience of art. You cannot decide, I want to make a great art piece, and then get a great art piece. <laughs> um, actually, very often you get the opposite result if you set up with that intention. Um, the experimentation, the improvisation plays with that, and you have to be open to what happens to it. You have to be open to react. So, and, and, and then respond to what has reacted and see more reaction and respond to it. And then it is data, or whether it is a material or another person or a crowd or a group of people, at times, with a lot of sacrifice, you get to that, to that state. And things really work. And it, it gives great pleasure as well. It, it, it can be... It brings me back to the example of a way way which well, you said that I think is right, is more visual communication than art in itself. Practice is based on participation, a group of people, practice based on, on involving the public are very difficult to manage and very often remain to the level of being a project where you have a set of intentions and you, you execute them, but they don't get into this state of intensity that we are describing. Now, this complicates the argument quite a bit. Is art actually changing and is going from this individual experience that is a traditional image of art and we have inherited from past centuries to something that is entirely different, where this is no longer important and is becoming an interactive operation, or even an interactive operation among many people, public technologies, we can still retain this moment where something steps out over and above and outside, and it goes somewhere else, outside time, as I said, and makes sense. It becomes a singularity, this absolute thing. Absolute not as in the God that is over there is absolute. Absolute because it is somehow self-sufficient, is it? It's a question I ask myself very often, I have not an answer. You need 50 more years of art history to look back and that's the case of not. Um, but it's very, it's very relevant to this problem. So it's very nice that you, you brought this question up because if you, if you think of the sacrifice you're speaking of, the faith, you, know, you, you write this so and I mentioned one sacrifices a lot for something that cannot be quantified and you can't even know if it will be there or not. But then how can you involve other people? On which basis? So there is an investment that can be collected, and very often it doesn't work, and sometimes it does. Is anybody working in participation things, or with other people? You as well. Yeah. I was thinking, it, when you work with what, like another person on a project, or even a, a piece of art, you often talk about practicalities, but you probably have your own secrets, individual secrets, they may, it, it, I think it's difficult to actually communicate that with somebody else, mm -hmm. and I think sometimes it depends on who's more dominant in a different part of that, you know, that relationship you're making, that can make a difference to what the outcome is, but I don't know that there is that sort of sharing, otherwise like you say, you kind of lose, lose it loses something. I mean, I've worked with another artist quite a lot, and I find it very difficult to articulate some of the things we've got. Um, and I think, so some things he leads on and some things I lead on, but I don't know that you can actually do that and sort of completely share. Because I don't know that I'm always really quite sure of what, where I'm going with something anyway, so to be able to articulate that to somebody else is very difficult. But once you articulate it, it stops being a secret. Yeah. So therefore, if you can't articulate it, that's more in line with the secret. Yeah. And I think it probably should stay that way. <laughs> yeah. But I think in how you choose to articulate when you're working with others in the mm. um, from my own experience, it's there's something more conscious as opposed to unconscious happening, really. 
sort of an aware uh, awareness that you have to kind of let go mm. of something almost in order to well, fuse well, together. Mm. I guess. So I think there's there's all sorts of things going on depending on the dynamics and mm. the setting. And it's quite complex, I think. I think you can end up feel, both of you feeling differently about something you created together as well. Mm. It means mm. different things to each other. And what about is anybody is anybody working with film video production that take time? I mean, not take time as in I'm filming for six days in a row or something. But you need different sections, different moments, and you're editing, and you're putting things together. And sometimes I film here, the film there. So you constantly interrupt what you're doing because you can't you work continuously for a month. And you need to sleep, eat, and so forth. Um, have you ever tried to do that? How do you find, how do you keep the tension? Is it possible to keep the tension? I mean, it is. People produce good cinema, so somewhere they work well. Not constantly, I think. Um, there's a tension there, and then a sort of rest. Mm -hmm. And things go on in my, in my mind during that time. Then I go back to it, and the tension is back again. That's how it works in video. Mm -hmm. You go back to it and you find the tension. Yeah, it's there. So you practice it enough so that it can it responds quite quickly. But it, does it also happen that sometimes you go back and oh, today is I'm so somewhere else I can't concentrate? No, not really. But when you talk, talk about ownership, mm -hmm. it's mine while I make it. Mm -hmm. But when it's finished, it doesn't belong to me anymore. Uh -huh. Do you belong to the world then? No, it becomes something else. It becomes independent from me. That's how it feels to me. It takes on different meaning as well. It kind of reminds me of um, Borat's Borat is a reader, Death of the Author. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a very kind of like post post modernism thing where that's why there's this participatory or it's going on compared to other times and how ownership or authorship doesn't really, it's not as. Like, I don't know, noble or whatever what the word is, as it was before, where content are generated by masses to create something. And most people, there's loads of appropriation art nowadays mm -hmm. as well. So I think the image of the artist as an uh, all knowing creator of something just doesn't really resonate that, to me so anyway. That's 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 true and it's correct. But at the same time, when you speak of appropriation, remediation, uh, these kind of things, you are still taking decisions. You as an individual, you as a collective, mm -hmm. and and those decisions generate some sort of situation, which demands a response, one way or another, from. Whoever else encounters it. So you see, I'm not speaking of photo, I'm not speaking of public anymore. Yet, you do something, really to break it down to the basics, which might generate an effect. So, although there is no longer an altar with you know, an aura around it, uh, there is no longer a golden frame around painting, there is no longer all this liturgy of the production of art, uh, nevertheless, Somebody is active and somebody reacts. Now, for that reaction to be interesting, probably the question of Kierkegaard is still relevant. You are, you are right. I mean, the, the question you are right, um, raising about this, the question of working collectively and defending the importance of art, are at the margin of what Kierkegaard speaks of here, because he very much speaks of a situation that is experienced by an individual that somehow steps out of the circulation of the economy of the universal. These are the margin, paradox in the paradoxical relationship with what can be said and understood by everyone. And it creates no little problem for political action, absolutely. But there is still, this is why I'm asking what you do and how you work, because it, it might be relevant in different ways to, to different practices, and maybe it can also be not relevant for somebody else. I'm not, but it doesn't have to be uh, dictatorial in position. Um, but I find very interesting the example of, of uh, video making. 
I, I never worked with uh, video productions, and I always wondered how can someone retain creativity, that state of creativity, when you have to manage people and times and budgets and move it around and, and waiting for the right the light to come on if you have to film or whatever. It really intrigues me. I, I think the tension is always there, though. Even when I'm not making it, I'm thinking about it. There's always a tension of some sort. Do you work with, do you film, I don't know, what kind of video work do you do? do you well, I use, um, well, for the last piece, I well, often use actors. So I work with people, obviously work oh, with so you work with people, so people. it's really a live situation. Yeah. I use storyboards and write script, except there's not often words in it, but you know, like sort of mm -hmm. a description of the scenes and stuff like that. I'm always thinking about it, about it, and the meaning, meanings behind them. And speaking of, sorry, your name? Right. Mark and? David. David. Mark was speaking of collaborating and the difficulties of getting to the same level and what one keeps away from from the other. You act more as a director, I assume. Yeah, but so it's still a collaboration of sorts, though, because I, try, I can try to direct an actor, mm -hmm. but they're going to bring in their own sort of interpretation yeah, of what I say. Yeah. So there's a change in, you know, what I try to communicate to them. They give their own interpretation. Like Hitchcock, for instance, was a stickler to, you know, he, he wanted exactly what he wanted. Mm -hmm. But I have so I I I allow I allow them to interpret what I say, really, and um, let them form their own sort of expressions or describe I mean, describe it in their own sort of uh, own terms. But is there a moment when um, then you recuperate your control, or you leave it? You leave the work spreading out. There's an element of control. But the then of the ownership and belonging that was brought right. up earlier. Yeah, so the ownership then goes back to me during the editing process. Mm -hmm. So I have control over that. Mm. Um, this, this is a step out of it, but it is not a step out as in somewhere else. Um, you must, might be familiar with the famous uh, text of Walter Benjamin, in the work of art in digital mechanical reproduction, where he speaks of classical art as an individual contemplation where the aura of the originality of the piece and the, the value of history attached to it. And then the new arts where the are experienced collectively and they are also experienced in a distracted way without a quasi-religious quasi experience of contemplation. Which, you know, cinema, photography, you know, things that are, are no original and the, the, the fact that it's original copy no longer matters what is important is the way one encounters it and also there is a passage that I think is extremely important in that text where it speaks of the new kind of artist that works with those technologies cannot be the same artist that one had encountered in classic disciplines because it's a different way of making work and it's a different way of encountering the work so even the figure of the artist changes it, it, it won't be the genius uh, the one you were describing, yeah. the author with the capital A that is there and creates things that are encountered with the horizon of the human soul, this kind of, of different uh, expressions. Um, Benjamin was interested in the comic, the, the cartoons of Mickey Mouse, and the way people were experiencing that, uh, and with laughter lighter things. Comedy was, you know, had always been relegated to the lower end of a static scale because it wasn't serious enough, it wasn't tackling very deep and profound issues. Why? It is really going at that. This is a new thing that is happening. This is the new material we're working with. What does it do? Now, can one, in the reaction to, to in, in parallel with the problem of, of um, Kierkegaard, is there Maybe not a fear and trembling as in this oppressive uh, experience, but there might be some sort of tension that leads to creativity. And then, then it's a sort of tension, this creativity, and it's open on, on the forms of work, and whether it is participation, whether it is actually communication for the defense of art. Can you reach that? How uh, is it possible to trigger it? Probably not on demand, but as you say, I've done enough practice to recall it 
rather easily. I have to find it every time I you know, go near the camera and the center and the, the group of people. I once had a commission, I had to direct technicians, and it was a nightmare for me because I just worked inside my head. So going out of it was a very uncomfortable, painful experience. Um, but there is a, I, I mention this parallel because I find there is a side to, to this argument of Kierkegaard, which is that art is born out of pain, it's a lie. It's something I don't necessarily agree with. There's an image of artists that now you have to go through this struggle, this suffering, this fear, and something to get to this special place. Why can one not laugh his way to it? I mean, why should we be that sort of sorry thing? Maybe it's just because it's too religious, I don't know, but there is a element. But isn't, isn't the idea of tension just a diluted form of that? Is it a Talking about tension, mm -hmm. talk about tension. Even though I don't think many people would like the idea of the artist has to experience pain, mm -hmm. but tension just seems like a di the same thing but slightly diluted. Okay. So you 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 would say so I, I, I don't mm -hmm. really relate to that that idea of tension. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that tension comes from setting the artist in opposition to the materials that the artist uses, whatever they may be, and the materials have to be overcome to achieve the the artwork, and then that's what's driving the tension. Can the tension then be a thrill or an excitement? Well, it, can be. it can be. Well, it's, say why not? it still yeah. seems as though it's kind of putting the artist in opposition with materials rather than. But what do you mean you, by opposition? It can be a very loaded um, concept in philosophy, but what, what, what do you mean in opposition there? In terms of just thinking about practically what happens when somebody mm -hmm. wants to make art, they have to engage with the materials or the art, whatever they may be, whether they're you know, paints, blocks of, of um, stone, situations in participatory art, the sort of the, the materials that the artist is working with. Um, and then this idea about tension seems as though the artist approaches these materials and has to do something with them, has to conquer them in some way to make the work, work of art happen. And that's where this risk may be. I was trying to think about this idea of risk because mm -hmm. that seems very socially constructed and the risk is only really within the logic of capitalism when when, is it? when things when mm -hmm. things have a cost. But if it's not just in the logic of capitalism, then maybe it's the risk of failing. Mm -hmm. But then failure, it only makes sense if the artist is in opposition to the materials that the artist is using. Like if if you work with those materials and see it more in the terms of Darwinian Darwinian evolution, say, and it's a network that there are operations happening within that network and it's tending towards something, there is no risk. So that's how you perceive. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's obviously it's just. There is no risk. Can you can you recall a moment when, uh, at some point, you were walking along, you were doing something, and you saw the next step. And then you thought, I can't possibly do that. That doesn't fit anywhere. That everybody would tell me, you know, that teachers, friends, families, you know, tell me I'm absolutely mad. But that's why I was saying it. This seems socially sort of constructed. But we are social animals. You know, there is no. But, but, okay, but besides that social. But if you, I mean, like if you, if you see it as, that, as you working with material, mm -hmm. then that step makes sense. There's no. There's mm -hmm. no point at which you'd say, oh God, I must be mad, somebody would say that this is mad. Because you're not thinking with like the hive mind of society. It's more about you working with the materials and mm -hmm. tending to see, sort of tending towards where that goes, but not in a purposeful way. I, I, I'm trying to, because maybe I'm not fully understanding what, you, what, what you're saying. The example I was making is that sometimes one gets to that state and it takes the leap of faith. It takes, you know, it takes branching you out of the set of things you accepted that were accepted for you, and you or you thought you were doing, and actually open up to this other, this new thing that just presented itself in front of you, and you did not expect it, you did not think of it, you did not want it, but actually it is what needs to be done for the work. That can be a patch of orange on, on a paint, can be. A, 
writing across your canvas because that's what happened all of a sudden, or it can be doing whatever it is that can work. Um, you can be saying, actually, I will do this action because this is exactly what needs to be done on the, on the website or whatever. It doesn't matter what's, what your material is, what your technology is, but there are moments where there are these terms and you get in tune with something that reveals itself to remains with the terminology of Kierkegaard. Reveals itself as a secret, precisely because it was not already circulating in the previous discourse, in the previous argument. You did not expect it. And this is why it is a paradoxical kind of economy. The, the secret is not somewhere else. The, the invention you're making is not beyond the horizon, and at some point you get to it, and say, ah, new idea, beautiful object. Art piece. It's not that. It's a, happens, happens as it becomes real with your work. So attention, attention brings you there, but um, I was sort of thrown off when you were saying in opposition with the material, mm -hmm. maybe I, I sort of misread what, what, what you were saying with that. Yeah, that's so that's attention, that's what I don't really so you think it is, there is a smooth relationship with work? I think there can be. There can be. I was just sort of trying to understand it. But okay, then let's not use the word tension sort of. and let's use the word intensity. At some point while working, something becomes hotter. It becomes more fun, put it like that. And sometimes it doesn't. Does this seem realistic? Well, for you, it's a, you, you, you've got the lack of being in a state of continuous <laughs> bliss. Yeah, pretty much. Well, what, what, what makes you continue or continuous despair? I was going to say what else. <laughs> what drives you forward in your life? What else is there to do? <laughs> no, don't be so bitter. I'm being realistic. Yeah, no, I, I choose to do it because I want to. No, but what is it that makes you want to? What is it that gives you the feeling that you need to complete occupation for many others? But I mean, oh no, it's the least of all possible. But I mean, not <laughs> <laughs> on a project just, by project basis. You collaborate like, with don't you, Johnson? Um, not really. <laughs> I've been involved in group work, but that was interesting because um, that was there was no collaborative work in it. It was more when I was writing about that, I wrote about it as um, the collaboratively generating similarities. Yeah, when people say they're collaborating, they're yeah. And it was just, it was kind of interesting because that was owned within the project, so that was what we were doing. It was a piece about collaboration, which I think speaks to this problem of getting into the mm -hmm. But um, done by Ryan Gandhi, Ryan Gander, with a French artist called Ryan Pamont where it was a, a gathering in London or something years ago that no longer exists. Um, where they started from laying floor, like a floor like this one made out of uh, some fish pole wooden tiles with very small pieces like this, from the opposite corners of the room. And the idea was to reach the center and have a continuous mood pattern because we had the same tiles and they would match. But obviously there were two different people and they, they, like, there would be inevitably some irregularities in the way they laid the tiles. And by the time they reached the center, the thing was completely misaligned. And again, I don't know if that was immediately the intention, but to me the piece spoke about, the, not the difficulties, but the, spoke about collaboration, and our collaboration is not as smooth as the name seems to mean. Right? It was a brilliant approach to that, um, because it was this fantastic network of tiles, loose on the floor, you could walk on the floor all over it, and they were getting to the center, and there was this crack, and sometimes it was getting closer, sometimes it obviously could never match, Some, somewhere else, all those, but not one. They were brilliant uh, as, a, as, a, as a, a experiment. Maybe it should be smooth anyway. I mean, it should be smooth. Resolve. It's 
the imperfection. Yeah. That's the key, isn't it? That's part of the secret, isn't mm. it? Flaws as well, that probably is. Yeah. Kind of yeah. Yeah. Things that you can't express but are essential to it. if it is that kind of fear of failing that may push you forward, that at some point that, that failing isn't crippling you, you're somehow picking yourself up and continuing. So it's how, how do we kind of continue with that anxiety in a productive way? It's kind of interesting, we just said anxiety and we were talking earlier about angst, mm -hmm. that sort of Stereotype about art, which I've never been able to get my head around. I don't feel particularly. Yeah, this is David again, because I uh, kill people, so I don't know why I keep switching. Uh, well, I'm only dyslexic at times, so uh, periodically, so you know, that's why. But, uh, um, yes, he, he does write about angst. And to him, the problem of creativity, he addresses the problem of creativity as through angst, as being in front of. Uh, an infinity of possibilities and picking the right one or picking one creates anxiety and that, that has become one of the keys through which the, the, the process of art is interpreted um, I find it a very uh, self-mortifying self um, description or, or explanation of the intensity not the need of attention to, to, to <laughs> of the intensity of creativity because I work personally with possibilities. I, I like to see, I, I don't like to work with official artistic technologies, materials, or disciplines. So I just go around town, see things, look at what I can, what I and sometimes something strikes me. I say, oh, if this is turned on the side, or if I take this concept, or I take this thing I'm seeing. And repurpose it, it just creates more problems than it does when it is good and it becomes interesting. For example, Saturday I saw, I don't know if there is one in Birmingham, I live in London, uh, Pret a Manger as a branch or a line of, for vegetarians. And instead of being red, it's green. And it's called Vegetarian Pret a Manger, Vegan Pret a Manger. Immediately I thought, hmm, how about vegan painting? Or how about something, something similar where I use the te techniques of marketing? as an artistic practice. What, 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 where can that take me? And there is no angst attached to this. It is exactly the opposite. I start from the level of I'm still <coughs> about, flannel like any wood, and if something calls my attention, then I can see what I can do with that. So there, are, there is, a, is, a, is a good point to, to observe in his work, the work of Kipler in this case, because the fear and telling the intensity, the way he presents it, has this sort of dark side. This is why I was speaking of three. You know, Johnny would plug uh, the sensual, the sexual to these and, and push it even more. She, 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 she's very good at developing all these arguments from that side of the question. Say, so why should it be that you know, one move starts from a suffering platform rather than happiness platform? Um, I don't know if you've already read the problems the next semester, the comment of Foucault about what does it mean you need to be sad to be a militant. It does come again from Hegel, which Kierkegaard criticizes, but sees always a subject needing to recuperate something that has been originally lost in order to be complete. You don't have to start with this lie. You don't have to start with the, 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 this uh, neg negative element that generates anxiety and one has to overcome the anxiety in the cathartic process. You can actually reach the intensity to other means. Don't tell this how to be drunk, so I don't take it anyway. but, So it's very interesting <coughs> to, to, to see these 
fear and trembling through a different filter. Uh, you are a teacher of art and design, art and design in secondary school. Yeah. And you were speaking about the, the assessment and bringing artists into school. Yeah, so I was explaining about how, in my experience as a teacher of working with artists, because naturally anyway, as an artist and as a teacher myself, I kind of see it as a dual identity that's constantly in conflict, because how I'd like to see art education run in secondary education and how it actually is are two very conflicting things. And I think um, I was explaining how when I've worked with artists in the past from a teacher perspective, I've, I mean, for example, I've taken a GCSE group to the Sarcher Gallery, worked with an artist there. Now, my group absolutely loved the day because it consisted of massive pieces of paper, you know, on the walls and flicking paint and blowing paint through straws and masking tape. And the artist was very much like, we're encouraging you to take risks, to see materials in different ways. Here's a stack of materials, play with them. And that was his objective for the day. Now, as an artist, I appreciated that methodology. It fits in with my utopian idea of how art should be taught and so forth. But actually, the reality of me then being a teacher was we took back these massive rolls of paper with ink splatters all over them. And I thought, well, we can't really do anything with this. And I've actually felt like I've wasted a day. Um, and again, that's the teacher in me talking <laughs> rather than the artist, because the kids loved it. But in terms of tangible, accessible outcomes, they couldn't be used, because how assessment works in art and design education is very formalised. And I was saying about how, even though on GCSE and A-level criteria, there's a whole assessment <coughs> objective dedicated to experimentation, um, the reality is that how you get the kids from the grade from that is that it has to be formally presented um, in a very neat, controlled way. You have to be able to analyse what you've done, explain why you've done it, how you've done it, and how it's going to meet a potential objective to fit in with another assessment objective, which is to realise your ideas. So, um, for me, those experiments from the day were, I suppose, they sum up my, my conflict with the artist ideal and the reality of teaching and how the two were completely contrasting and we were just speaking about what you were involved in. Creative with, partnerships. Creative par partnerships, which, which is a government-funded thing under Labour, um, which obviously isn't around anymore. Um, but we were saying about how that was all about artists coming into school and trying to give teachers, empower them really, to teach in different ways. And I just explained the difficulties with that and the fear culture within education now and the fact that your art has to be assessed. And I suppose it's similar here. Our artwork will have to be assessed and it's that idea of should art be assessed. Then, I would so link it to your work earlier saying that this is only to quotation a social form of restraints. How, I find that only, for me this is, how do you understand that only? Because I don't see there is a room outside, a place outside that one, one can operate. Or is there? Because, yeah, I, I, I don't think social norms are something that we're bound <coughs> by, and that we choose to be. So that's why I say only. But then, the education of children in the country at the moment, so the adults of the future, are manufactured according to this universal uh, uh, translatability principle of assessment, which wants to reduce everything to something that can be quantified across the heterogeneity of disciplines that can be teaching arithmetics or teaching art. So we have, there is a, a, a thing there, a problem, a contradiction, which is quite strong. Well, I mean, I, I used to teach, and my impression is that, unfortunately, teaching is more about justifying 
the process rather than what's good for children, rather than not politically anyway. That's probably the reason why I don't teach any more. I'm a teacher, but it's, it's a I used, I used to teach. I used to teach photography, mm -hmm. and um, <coughs> I was given the job because I they knew I could administrate basically. Yeah. And that's what the role of teaching is. Mm -hmm. It's not the role of an artist. Mm -hmm. It's it's the role of a facilitator and an administrator, isn't it? Or an enabler. That's basically what I got. I just been doing that with a kid. So I'm the artist in residency at Birmingham Museum. Mm -hmm. I brought in a kid from school to work in the workshop with me and they go back for a week to create a piece of work. And the work that they get back, it seemed like it was constructed by the teacher. As if there's a project that yeah. teacher set for them to do and then gave it to me. That's exactly what I got. But the, yeah. mm -hmm. but the special thing is That's that I keep measurable. contact with the actual students. Mm -hmm. So when they go home, I keep on Facebook, something we're not supposed to. So we keep talking to the kids and I encourage them to do what they want. And that's, so they feed me with what the teachers want, with the criteria. So if you want the art to work with the kid, you have to kind of have to give the kid the artist push. Like you do whatever you want. At the end of the day, you do what you want. But then there's a criteria there, just take the box. And that's what I did. You are obliged to take that box. Yes, and also I was explaining how now under the Conservative government, teachers' pay is now related to um, academic outcomes. So you, it's results-based and your appraisal is based on results as well. So um, you have to jump through lots of hoops now. So there is a, a fear factor for teachers that you cannot allow your pupils to fail. And I would also say that pupils know that and they are becoming lazier. And I would also say that my students on that day where they were flicking ink and everything at the Saatchi Gallery, initially they had no idea where to begin. And I would say that the whole culture in education now is there is no element of play um, and that they don't actually know how to play. And so part of that day was helping them realise that play is acceptable, but I don't think even children are encouraged to do that as much anymore. But I think it's the whole fear factor, it's the whole system, and I suppose that's why I'm here to critique it and <laughs> reflect on it. I think that's operating on two levels though, like in terms of the assessment of art, that's sort of being remodelled to conform to a fairly long now European history of trying to quantify everything. Um, and how do you how do you quantify the production of art? Well, you don't you just graft on uh, an assessment scheme from another subject, which is easy to quantify. Um, but in a kind of on the broader scale of arts in the curriculum, the curriculum in this country has been totally saturated by the logic of the market. So the government sees young people as a commodity to be invested in and subsequently to be sold to employers, um, and it's not seen that art has any um, market value in, in that sense and I was involved with a project earlier on this year that was Arts Council funded through the Bridge Organisation for young people who wanted to go into creative careers um, but between the sort of genesis of the project and the implementation of it creative careers got sort of transmuted into careers in the creative industries, mm -hmm. which is a euphemism for graphic design mm -hmm. um, and uh, web design, video production, that sort of thing. So it's the commercial end of the creative industries. Mm -hmm. um, and that was funded by the Arts Council, which is there to promote art. Mm -hmm. So I, mean, like, I think I just see the problem on those two levels. Mm -hmm. No, you're absolutely right. You know, <coughs> I'm recalling your comment was not critical. Um, I was not addressing it critically, I found it, it is No, I was just sort of responding to what you were saying, but I don't have a solution. Just <laughs> 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 adding to. <laughs> <laughs> but then, then, my hope that one can actually be very happy with making is sort of quashed by the fact that there is actually fear in the here mm -hmm. to break out of this um, universalization toward the lowest mm -hmm. possible end. This continues this kind of um, it's an institutionalisation of those people. So not that at a student level, um, they're not able to then form their own language. It's becoming the language of the market and business, and continuing that as the next line of workers for the, the industry. And um, 
I work um, at Wolverhampton University and you were saying about students not knowing what to do. Mm. They're like that when they enter university yeah. as well. Um, and being kind of starting with very small sketchbooks and like, what do I do? How do I act here? Not even knowing how to relate in a, stu in a studio. It's good to take risks. Yeah, and, and it's always, so what module does this relate to? And how, what, when will I get kind of graded on this? Um, will I fail this? So it's, yes, you almost have to un unlearn, yeah. particularly in first year, it's, it's unlearning, trying to unlearn all of those kind of um, rigid structures that we have to go through um, for previous education. It's like a legacy. Um, but then let's throw on the table another option. Um, what if instead of having the staff of the tutor of the lecture here assessing our work, it will be a collective thing. At the end of the year, we put up an exhibition and then give the group of students that have been working together uh, or in sync or off sync, but anyway, developed during the same year of work, collectively judge each piece. Would that be a viable way of doing it? Or would mm -hmm. repeat this in yeah. <laughs> 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 like, why not? Yeah. Now, I, I came from the BA here, and I don't know if we were just a particularly challenging year, but it would have been a complete disaster. <laughs> there was so much tension, there was so much fighting, there was so much kind of people. Yeah, it was very sort of. Pretty sure we would have all failed, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, the other thing, the thing you've got to remember is that we're talking about education specifically, but that's something that's integral to a lot of other things in our society. So actually, if you're an artist and you're taking that, you're making those steps to becoming a professional artist, you're still going to be judged oh, by yeah. people, whether it's mm. curators or you know somebody who's going to commission you, and that's not really that dissimilar to being marked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On a course, mm -hmm. it's the same process, just a slightly different angle on it. Except you may get actual feedback from those processes. That feedback into your work, whereas a you grain that not. says, "Well, they just work and they don't like what actually mm -hmm. what you produce," you might not get paid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually, attractive. you know, it's it's got its own huge set of problems. But how? In, in, I mean, in terms of like getting a grade or uh, a new um, an A for something. No, but what I'm saying is that I think, I mean, I've, I've sort of practiced art for a while and applied for residencies and kind of thing. half the time, I mean, you do get them and you get feedback sometimes, but sometimes you get nothing. Yeah. You don't even get the acknowledgement that you've applied. <laughs> yeah. And if you ask for feedback, you'll sometimes get just a, a you know, a fairly... Well, it becomes someone senior or something like that. Yeah. yeah. It's difficult. So it, it really is no different. It's, but then, without just strolling off into ranting about how bad the art movie is over, uh, <laughs> which is very easy and deserves it. But um, then, then we, staying with this problem of Kierkegaard poses, then uh, uh, my, my reaction to this in the past has been, I don't want to engage with that race to become famous. I keep a job on the side, part time, and I do what I want on my own terms. And if someone then wants to engage with me about what I've done, whether it is a friend or, or a more official figure, it's fine. But I want to do what I want to do on my own terms. It worked for a while. Then it started paying back and there were more responses. But then I started studying philosophy with Johnny and I left it to the side for a few years. Now we'll go back to it. But would that be keeping your secret safe or just giving up too much? I never had an answer to but a lot of people criticize me for it because uh, well, you're not really engaging, you're a dilettante, you're doing something. You know, like, you're doing something. <laughs> I am doing it all the time, but, um, including studies. But, um, the, the, but I, want, I wanted just to bring back this problem of this social structure that one way or another wants to reduce to this thing that Kierkegaard calls the universal, something that is that has an individuality, whether it is a single person or a group working together, whether it is a moment 
that one reaches or a moment a group reaches through improvisation and exchange and is completely ephemeral and nobody owns it and yet owns it. There is something that can never be completely controlled. And that seems to me that what is interesting in Kierkegaard, although he speaks about faith in these terms, it also speaks about earthly experience. Seeking that is one of the keys into creativity. How one reaches it is up to each one, independently, uh, autonomously, differently. Um, because otherwise, then one has, we have to change the society entirely in order, in order to be artist in that work. You can try, but it's, you can make it back to your work. But, but it would be a much, no, it's sort of massive thing that you, you, indeed it is paradoxical. Um, gosh, that, that killed me. You can step out of society though, can't you, in order to do that. Yeah, it's like babies, right, in, that, in the eye of the storm. So you say you can or you can? You can. Mm -hmm. You can go and live on the beach in a hut and you'll be coming up. <laughs> That's a nice utopian thing. Can you go and live on the beach in a hut? I'd love to do it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> would that be holiday or would that be...? No, just for the just to be away from mm -hmm. everybody and to be with the elements and to be mm -hmm. fully in that creative space. But if you want to do it forever, you'd probably be hauling wood and cleaning out your uh, hole in the earth full of trees. That's creative as well, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's creative. It's creative. It's creative. It's creative. It's creative. Would that be like sort like of turning the entire life into a secret and reducing the universal <laughs> to that point? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I keep thinking of the secret, and I, I, I think I'm probably taking offence at terminology again, but I don't think it's one secret. It seems just too laden with it, occult and mysticism, mystical no, it kind is, of association. No, it's not in that just, sense. I, I understand what you're saying. No, it is, it, it, is, it is laden with something that is also in part problematic. Um, yeah, we have, we have time just to... The problem that Kierkegaard has with this universal is that everything is there in function of something else. If he speaks, uh, he's writing mostly against Hegel, for whom history is a process that is teleological. It has an end insight, and everything happens in order to get to that point. So everything is a step that is not really functional in itself. That is in function of something else. It, this something else is actually a massive totalizing consciousness, which is parallel, at least, to a divine consciousness, where the, the history of the universe and the universe and the mind that is conscious of this history become one thing. So one, it, this is a complete totality made where everything is transparent from this upper eye that sees it all. And everything is also translatable, because if each step is in function of an end, each step is valid as much as the next one. Everything is a currency for the next step, and every, and every step is the same currency, it's got the same value to get to the end point. He wants to resist that. He wants to carve something, some space out of it, or open up an exit in some form, where the relationship to this entirety is of a different kind, and is far more intense, and this is what he calls the absolute. The absolute that is in, belongs to the individual, is in the experience of the individual, um, and is, uh, is not this universal, which is the horizontal equivalence of all values. Exactly the, the measuring of all activities in school according to the same parameter. Or the fact that everything can be reduced to an economic value, money. So, mm -hmm. And there are some things that one would like not to be quantified in terms of money. But the, the, quanti the quantifying things in financial terms is a universal way of approaching it. So it, he resists that, and he presents these paradoxical situations where there are two set of rules which are in complete contradiction. So better is one set of rules which is recognizable, the human laws, the society laws, that, and then the other one, 
which seems mad, absurd. Why would you do? Why would you kill your only child that you waited so much for? Um, because some sort of voice in your head told you to do so. You know, it, it seems no, completely nonsensical, and yet, whether it is the sacrifice in religious terms or this other form of contrasting oneself to, to these things that, for, for the ease of now, we simply stick to the name of faith, you, you withdraw, you, keep, you carve something out, and that, that remains secret in the sense that it becomes opaque. It's no longer transparent. Can, mm -hmm. It, it, it is it is secret in the sense it is invisible to the to the quantifiability of the translation that was presented earlier. Uh, so you, you 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 keep it secret. I cannot say it. Not simply I do not want to say it, but it is something that I cannot say on pain of destroying it and also destroying myself. At least at least as an artist, for what you are concerned. So that, that is secret. Maybe yes, it is. Uh, it is not. Yeah, because it just seems to me like it would be a lot easier to talk about this in terms of the subjectivity of experience. Because that seems to be what it's getting No, at. I believe that that would be very different. Uh, That's what it seem, seems to be, that this secret is essentially the fact that what we experience is subjective and we can't translate or share that with another person who's got a different subjective experience. It seems to be that there's a tension between objectivity no, and subjectivity. No, I, I haven't been clear enough on this. The opposition is not between what I experience and perceive or think or feel and what you think and feel and what she thinks or feels. The difference is between a set of uh, parameters that makes everything uh, sayable because it is translatable, because you can see it, name it, quantify it, and replaces one for the other, and something that has a value in itself and cannot be compared, is incommensurable. So if, if you try to make it, to compare it, it finds no combination and it's just a paradox, it's absurd. It's like, why would you sacrifice yourself? But in that very special frame of mind of an individual speaking to God, that's what he has to do. It's not even the right thing or the wrong thing. That's what mm -hmm. he has to do. It, does, it has no justification. You can, if you are, start asking why, you, you can't get an answer to that. That's the kind of leap that is is trying to, to present in this concept. So you get out of that which can be said. You can get out of that which is valid for everyone for something that is valid only for one, for one moment for one person, for one situation, for one tension in the musical group. We, we have explored these possibilities, but the, what happens here is a game, or better, is a, is a cut between that which is commensurable, that which I can measure this for that, I can change, exchange this for that, whether it is language where I, can have a, I have a noun for an object, or it is a column where I have a prize for an object, it doesn't matter, there is this exchangeability, everything is commensurable, it's something that is incommensurable, it just stays for itself, by itself there. And it doesn't, now, I make this gesture as if this would be an object staying outside the universality, but it can just be picked up open in the universality, where you're just gazing out, and there is something that you cannot describe any better than something, and yet you stay with it. And that's, is what, is that's the, this is the sort of tangent point that he's after. Yeah. No, I get that. It's just that I think what, like where the argument seems to be coming from to, to me is that base question about whether reality is objective or subjective. And it looks like he's trying to put a subjective version of reality into objective reality. It almost looks like it's an argument against objective reality, but trying to do so in a way that's still fits in with the belief system of God and it needs to be objective. Mm. So did did, did this resonate with, with anybody else here the same or something similar <coughs> in the text? Yeah, I think I think is I guess subjective experience is something that you can quantify and that we can all collectively understand even though it varies from you to you. Mm -hmm. Whereas the secret is or has, has always been and will always be in, in conflict with 
reality and the world people mm-hmm. because it's you, know, you can't grasp all of it. It's not, it seems weird to think we're spending two hours talking about something that is not <laughs> uh, uh, tangible, can't be spoken about. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Subjectivity, just isn't it? Subjectivity is universal, and the subjectivity is still got language that we can describe. That's how I see it. I believe that what. Yeah, when I was talking about objective and subjective reality, though, I was talking about this tension between knowing that the world exists or doesn't because all we have is the brain. So in terms of no, then it, it is not that. Then, then I understand. What, no. Because it looks like he's trying to put that form of subjectivity into an objective universe, an objective universe that does objectively exist, but it's the subjectivity of a mind which has no proof. No, it is a different. It's a different, it's a different it's kind of problem is that you're bringing up about the objective and the subjective. Um, I know, but that's what that's what I, that's what this seems to sort of come from. Um, because Hegel's totalizing <laughs> system presupposes an objective reality. To a certain extent, but I don't think. I mean, that one could argue argue for forever about this because mm. this philosophy is the game of arguing. But <laughs> <laughs> um, I, in, in my understanding. We, don't want to assert with any special authority. I, I believe that what Kierkegaard is after is not the distinction between subjective and objective, but as he repeats, um, is the distinction between that which is universal, that is that which is accepted by everyone or imposed as valid for everyone, and that which escapes that. It is similar to a distinction between subjective and objective because one could think that objective is valid for everyone and subjective is individual, but he is not speaking about a world outside and a world inside. He is speaking about a, a, a logic that makes th- uh, things circulate for everyone, and instead a logic that is valid only in one instance. And the, the logic that makes things circulate for everyone, circulate for everyone is not objectivity. It's not the, the logic of, of an objective reality that exists outside there. It's, it's a set of rules, it's parameters. It mm-hmm. doesn't have to do with the existence of an object or of a world, uh, with an end. but it has to do with a set of values that is shared by everyone and a way to implement and communicate them. Um, so, you know, in the Eastern, in the, in the cases that you, you know, your own rules, yes, you obey God, but you know, you the value of the family, the value of the child, the value of the human life, these are laws that we all share. And, uh, and then there is this other thing which functions according to its own rules. And that's the, the, the contrast, the paradox that he finds, and which can only be approached to this more logical process of fear and trembling. Or angst, mm-hmm. or something else, but this sort of emotional, uh, non linear um, um, way of thinking and acting and being. So, in this sense, um, although there might, be, there might seem to be a similarity between objective, subjective, and universal, individual, or universal and absolute, it is not, it is not the same. I suppose, yeah, I suppose what I'm saying is it looks to me like the, the problem is within the metaphysics. This just talks about society, really. It does talk about society, and but it does yeah. it, it, it kind of presupposes some sort of metaphysics, which I, I don't quite understand how that resolves. No, it's, it's yes, probably, yeah, okay, I get what probably, you mean. But I didn't know that's the position I was coming no, from. No, 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 it's not, it's not the metaphysics. <laughs> I'll try to give a very short answer because otherwise it takes some time somewhere else. But it's not, there is a metaphysic, a metaphysical position because it is attached to an irreligious position. Yes, obviously. Um, what is interesting is uh, moving through the text with keeping artistic experience in mind is the distinction between the reduction of everything to a measurable something and 
the keeping the gate open towards something that cannot yet be named, therefore cannot yet be measured, cannot yet be given a place. This is the contrast he's working with. Or at least this is the contrast that is interesting to lift from his text and the level for us. Do you, does this distinction make sense for you? Good.